We are very excited to have Dr. Hazen today, who did his clinical training in internal medicine, as well as a fellowship in diabetes, endocrinology, and metabolism from Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, and then moved on to a PhD in biophysical chemistry and molecular bi biology from Washington University School of Medicine. He, at this time, holds multiple leadership positions, including chair of the Department of Cardiovascular and Metabolic Sciences at Lerner, as well as co-section head of preventive cards and rehab, along with director of the Center for Microbiome and Human Health. Dr. Hazen has over 136,000 citations and has published over 450 peer-reviewed articles in basic and clinical journals. As we already saw in the case, he has made pioneering discoveries in new understandings of mechanisms that contribute to cardiovascular and inflammatory disease research. Uh, we know that his research in multiple areas has impacted clinical practice and lays the foundation for both FDA and EU clear diagnostic tests for CVD risk assessment. He's an elected fellow to both the National Academy of Medicine and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and is also an elected member of the American Association of Physicians. Dr. Hazen, thank you so much for presenting to us today. Oh, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I am going to today talk about a topic which you probably don't um, uh, use much in your practice yet, but uh, I would bet that your patients are actually becoming more and more familiar with, and that's the gut microbiome. Um, also, I hope to convince you by the completion of today's presentation that actually, uh, as endocrinologists, you should know that the gut microbiome is the largest endocrine organ in our bodies and it is a potential therapeutic target, whether that be through uh, manipulation by diet or in the future by uh, small molecule therapeutics. Um, I think uh, we're aware uh, acutely that cholesterol is a mainstay, a main target for preventive efforts. Um, but one thing that I hope to also uh, impress is that we need to move beyond cholesterol, and that's because significant residual cardiovascular risk remains even despite lowering of cholesterol levels to exceedingly low uh, levels. So, for example, if one looks at uh, in the statin era of uh, placebo-controlled randomized trials, which are illustrated in this slide, um, we can achieve marked reduction in LDL. For example, the Jupiter study, which is the last of the large placebo-controlled uh, uh, statin intervention trials with Crestor and subjects who began with a normal LDL and had to have a heightened marker of inflammation, such as CRP and an additional risk factor, whether it be mild hypertension or low HDL, they achieved a 56% uh, reduction in cardiovascular disease risk, a, a halving of the risk, but that means that there still is significant residual cardiovascular events occurring. 44% of events remained. Now, we of course have now added to our armamentarium uh, beyond statins with PCSK9 inhibitors, such as Repatha and Praluent, um, and studies like Odyssey and Fourier, where Rather than a, uh, a placebo-controlled randomized trial, these are in the setting of optimal statin-tolerated uh, therapy and then randomized on top of that. So an additional uh, cholesterol lowering was achieved, up to 70% LDL reduction in subjects who are taking a combination of statins and PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, with a, a further reduction in event rate of about 15%, but yet there still is a significant cardiovascular risk remaining, and cardiovascular disease is remaining the major cause of mortality uh, in subjects. So even though individuals whose LDL was brought down to levels less than 25, which is uh, a quarter of the subjects in these trials had LDL levels that are exceedingly low, still, and while they had the lowest cardiovascular events in the trial, there still nonetheless were up to 30 to 40 percent of events continued to occur. So factors outside of cholesterol lowering have to be considered if we're going to eradicate cardiovascular disease. Besides, the majority of patients who present to our clinics already have established cardiovascular disease. And so the factors 
I would say keep in mind that the factors that lead to exacerbation of disease or acute events are not always the same as the factors that lead to those slow progression of disease over the course of decades. So what I hope to convince you is this process, uh, this uh, endocrine organ called the gut microbiome contributes to cardiovascular disease. Now, what exactly uh, am I talking about? So uh, gut microbes uh, are essential to human health. Um, they actually play a critical role in our intestines in terms of promoting intestinal health and, and helping to educate our immune system. Um, actually, the, uh, they, they form a barrier against invading pathogens. Uh, many, some vitamins that we eat, are, such as vitamin K, are critically dependent upon bacteria to be generated. Um, and uh, as you will see, that gut bacteria can generate metabolites that are biologically active, that are transported by the circulatory system, and then impact the host uh, by a variety of different physiologic processes. So they fulfill all of the requirements necessary for a, a canonical uh, definition of a hormone. The other thing I just wanted to point out how big this system is, we have at any given time um, uh, an enormous amount of bacteria in our intestines and um, the number of genes that these bacteria harbor is anywhere from 10 to 100 fold higher than the number of genes in a homo sapien cell. And so the microbes within our intestines greatly expand the complement of the types of biochemical metabolic pathways available to each of us. And uh, it's kind of an interesting factoid, if you will, if we each were distilled down into a pile of DNA, Homo sapien DNA would not be the majority of the DNA in that pile from each of us. It would actually be bacterial DNA would be the majority by mass. So there, are, you know, bacteria are quite, uh, they're just bags of DNA and, um, and there's an enormous amount of them there. And it's remarkable that we really up to the last decade until then had not even been considering these as potentially contributing to our overall uh, physiology and health. I'm gonna kind of just give you the take home messages right here at the very beginning. And that is first that the gut microbiome is a filter of our largest environmental exposure. And that's what we eat. Think of food as a foreign object that we consume at a kilogram quantity daily. And so um, when you think about environmental exposure, um, it's not just the pollution in the air, it's literally the, 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 the food on our plate and the impact it makes on our overall metabolism. And that is experienced through the filter of the gut microbiome. Um, I've already pounded away at this concept that the gut microbiome is, is a very large endocrine organ. And what I hope to convince you of is that uh, microbial products and pathways contribute to susceptibility for cardiovascular disease and metabolic disorders. And uh, while we have very good data that this is actually uh, happening in mammals, for example, um, we have yet to actually leverage this to actually, uh, through randomized trials, show benefit. But that, I guarantee, will be coming in the coming decade, how quickly this field is advancing. This slide illustrates a, um, a number of different diseases and uh organ systems in which the gut microbiome targets. And it's already substantially outdated, um, but I would point out that beyond the simple association of sequencing stool, uh, bacterial DNA, and looking at characteristic microbial community compositional changes, which is what many of the gut microbe type of papers that are published do, and those are just purely association only. With many of the diseases here that are illustrated, the actual fulfillment of Cox postulate has been done where one could transplant microbes from an affected individual into 
a host, a new host, and transmit the phenotype. And what I will show you is the example in which our laboratory was the first to do, and that is that one could literally transplant microbes from an atherosclerosis prone individual um, or uh, inbred strain of mice and transplant that into germ-free recipients and transmit susceptibility for atherosclerosis. I'll show you examples of how you can transmit susceptibility for heightened clotting risk. And some of the very earliest studies that were done in this kind of way uh, looked at transmission of susceptibility for obesity and uh, diabetes by transplanting gut microbes from an affected individual into germ-free recipients and showing that you literally could transmit these cardiovascular and metabolic phenotypes into the recipient. So how did we actually begin studying the gut microbiome? Uh, I think one of the uh, most fascinating things is that if one looks at the compounds that are in our blood or in our plasma and tries to understand the structure of these compounds, the vast majority of the compounds in our blood, we do not know what the structure is. If one does a mass spectrometry based study, you don't see in the reports when you get them from, for those who do research, the unknowns, uh, but they far exceed the, um, the structures that we do know where over 50% are unknown. And so think of it as dark matter. And in the universe, they say 80% of the mass of the universe is dark matter. I would argue that that's probably about the numbers of the dark matter in our own plasma and our own serum in terms of understanding what the compounds are. Uh, and in fact, in a postprandial setting, those numbers, the dark matter is much, much bigger. We just don't know what a lot of the compounds that are circulating are and whether they have a phenotype. So. Starting literally about 15 years ago, we began some mass spectrometry studies to try to ask, could any of these compounds be contributing to this residual cardiovascular risk? Could we find chemical signatures in blood that predicted the future development of cardiovascular disease? So what we tried to do is to use a series of case control studies and mass spectrometry in a form of something called untargeted uh, metabolomics to see whether or not we could identify chemical signatures that predicted the future development of disease in subjects, but where at the time the blood was drawn, the patients or the subjects had no evidence of disease. And so this was how TMAO was identified, and I'll show you another example of a compound that actually contributes to cardiac disease and diabetics. But after you, you identify the potential candidate compounds, it then we, have to then validate it by developing very specific assays that will distinguish that compound versus other structural isomers and in an independent non-overlapping set of you know controls case control studies show that it does indeed predict the future development of disease um, once we know what the compound is that's just association uh, we then have moved on uh, to performance of multiple mechanistic studies where we feed the compound or its nutrient precursor to animals as well as in humans and look at the physiologic effects that are observed to demonstrate causality to the phenotypes observed. And then with this, then we finally are enabled to develop drugs to try and target these pathways and see can we impact the disease process. This has been done now in many, many uh, animal models of disease and is now being developed with human intervention studies targeting the gut microbiome. So stay tuned for that. So what I'm gonna describe is one of the approaches that was done not for TMAO, but for a new pathway that came out um, it was a result of over seven years of work, uh, was published in the middle of the pandemic, so didn't really actually make as big a splash as we had, had hoped. Um, but it began with this overall logic or thinking. We know that diabetes is a coronary artery disease disc risk equivalent. This is a classic Kaplan-Meier plot from Steve Hafner and colleagues that was published in the New England Journal almost a quarter century ago now, uh, where what they looked at is the concept that subjects who have diabetes and no known cardiovascular disease, their future risk of cardiovascular disease is equivalent to a non-diabetic patient who had experienced already one heart attack uh, and came up and coined the term of a coronary disease risk equivalent. 
Um, but what it actually suggests and underscores is a tenant that we have been, you know, using um, in our preventive programs, uh, and that is, is that subjects with diabetes are at much higher risk for the developing cardiovascular disease. Well, one thing that's a little less known than that is that if one clamps their, uh, does intensive uh, glucose lowering therapy, while one can actually lower the risk of microvascular complications such as nephropathy or retinopathy or neuropathy, uh, and that's kind of illustrated in this uh, trial, the advanced cooperative group. Um, what you do not see is a change in macrovascular complications such as heart attack, stroke, and death from cardiovascular disease. And so diabetes clearly has, it, we have a, a glucocentric view of what diabetes is. It's how we define diabetes, but yet there are factors that are metabolic processes beyond glucose that contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease because clearly drugs that only lower glucose, even including insulin um, or sulfonylureas, for example, we can lower microvascular complications but do not lower macrovascular complications. Multiple clinical trials have supported this tenant. And so this suggests that factors beyond glucose are observed in diabetes and contribute to the cardiovascular disease. Well, how do we find these metabolic factors? We tried using an untargeted metabolomics approach on diabetics. So this kind of slide illustrates what we did. And on the left-hand side, you can see that we started with over a thousand subjects who had not experienced any cardiovascular disease and were diabetic um, at the time. Uh, when the plasma was drawn, and we then performed untargeted metabolomics to look at chemical signatures in the blood that predict the future development of disease. Now, on the right-hand side, there's three Venn diagrams, which kind of show some of the, the lenses that we placed on trying to prioritize those chemical signatures. First, we wanted to make sure that the compounds that we were looking at were uh, different in diabetics compared to non-diabetics. Uh, I say different because in theory they could be lower, but for the most part we focused on compounds that were higher in diabetics compared to non-diabetics. Our primary outcome that we uh, looked for were compounds that predicted the future development in the next three-year period of a heart attack, a stroke, or death uh, in the subject. And then we also uh, put a, a, a filter on the compounds in terms of how do we prioritize them that we thought that they should not be the compounds that we were looking at should not be highly correlated with uh, indices of glycemic control because starting back with the, the whole concept that I began with we know that uh, intensive control was not a strong predictor of lowering cardiovascular risk and so therefore um, it was suggested that this metabolite might not be very tightly linked to glucose levels. Now, when we did this with over a thousand subjects, we can actually rank these chemical signatures and assess their prediction for future MI stroke or death. And that's shown in these forest plots. Um, one of these is for the polar molecules, the other is for lipid-based molecules. Um, and But using this approach, we can prioritize them and come up with a list of candidate compounds that track with these three uh, screening strategies, if you will. So what I'm showing you here is a table um, that uh, is in this publication that came out uh, just a, a year and a half ago, um, where we can divide the compounds into what we call knowns and unknowns. And that has to do with whether we recognize what their structure is or not. Um, and what was interesting is amongst the knowns, TMAO was one of the top known compounds. Actually, over a decade ago when we first discovered TMAO, it was an unknown compound. But, you know, the field is moving quite fast and a lot of that dark matter in our plasma and serum is trying to be uh, demystified by figuring out what the structures of all these unknown compounds are. And we'll talk mostly about TMAO in the second half of the talk. Um, I would point out that this column on the left where I say these compounds, whether they're knowns or unknowns, whether they're linked to gut microbiome uh, is indicated, and I'll show you an example how we determine this, and it has to do with whether or not uh, placing subjects on antibiotics suppresses the level of the metabolite, uh, indicating 
uh, potentially a gut microbial contribution to their formation. What I'm going to talk to you about are the known co uh, unknown compounds. And so we were interested in what was the top ranked unknown compound and how it tracked with disease. This is kind of a meaningless phrase of uh, letters here, but it, a hillock is a silica-based column and positive ion mode. It had a molecular weight of 265 and uh, high levels of it corresponded to a, over a two-fold increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and death in the ensuing three-year period. So this unknown compound, I'll just flash forward to the end, it turned out to be something called, which you probably haven't heard of yet, phenylacetylglutamine. I'll talk about it as calling it PAG or and shown in the bottom right is data from uh, a couple of dozen subjects, healthy volunteers, where we measured their or isolated blood or their plasma, placed them on a cocktail of poorly absorbed antibiotics. These are antibiotics usually given intravenously, but instead we gave them orally to suppress intestinal microbes. So gentamicin, vancomycin, neomycin, uh, metronidazole, ciprofloxin, a cocktail of five antibiotics. This cocktail actually and historically had been used by rectal surgeons as a way of uh, so-called sterilizing the gut. It's no longer used for that purpose, but it, it can be given to people. And what you can see here is that when we measure this analyte that turned out to be phenylacetylglutamine or PAG, uh, with the oral antibiotic cocktail, the level is dramatically suppressed. And then if subjects come back a month later and have their blood drawn, their levels are back to normal again. So the overall scheme, which we'll go through in detail in the ensuing half hour, um, is a, shown here where after ingesting a protein meal, phenylalanine through the gut microbiome gets converted into a precursor that after absorption into the portal blood through the liver gets metabolized to generate this compound called PAG. And then PAG is then converted uh, or impacts the host, uh, us, by uh, impacting uh, platelet function and arter artery wall function in a way that enhances susceptibility for thrombotic events, as I'll show you. And it actually happens to be through adrenergic receptors. So, after identifying PAG through the untargeted metabolomic study, which themselves are not intrinsically quantitative, they're semi-quantitative, so we developed a very specific assay for quantifying PAG and separating it from other structural isomers, and then applied it to an independent uh, cohort of subjects over 4,000. And what we then saw, and that's illustrated here, is that higher levels of PAG are associated with higher risk of major adverse cardiac events, that's MI, stroke, or death, in the ensuing three-year period. And it was about a two-fold increase in risk. This is the hazard ratio and the 95% confidence interval. And the graph on the left is for MACE, major adverse cardiac events. The forest plot in the middle is for diabetics, and the one on the right is for non-diabetics. And so... What was interesting is while our original scheme for identifying this pathway was predicated on the concept that it was enhanced in diabetics, it did not exclude the fact that the pathway still might be operative in non-diabetics. And in retrospect, this turned out to make sense, that if one identifies a pathway that's linked to cardiovascular risk and enhanced or accentuated in diabetics, it still could be operative in non-diabetics. And we are seeing, you know, quite uh, pronounced uh, prognostic value with the marker in non-diabetics as well. So early on, we focused on thrombosis with this molecule, and that's because the human phenotypes that we focused on were heart attack and stroke uh, with our major adverse cardiac events. And so what we saw is that uh, when one took isolated platelets, for example, and incubated them with physiologic levels of PAG, we could show that stimuli that activated platelets would elicit a more robust response. So for example, at a submaximal level of thrombin, you would get dose dependently a higher release of intracellular calcium or a greater extent of aggregation or a tighter binding to collagen. And in fact, if one infuses PAG in vivo, and then looks at an in vivo thrombosis assay, and I'm going to show you this kind of assay several times during the remaining talk. 
um, you could actually directly visualize enhanced thrombosis potential. So in this assay, what we do is we, on one side in the, uh, give a, a, a dye that actually specifically targets platelets and makes them fluorescent. And then do a surgical cut down on the internal carotid artery and then using a fluorescent vital microscope, we can visualize the carotid artery and then give it an injury in the form of exposure to ferric chloride. And then if one watches over time with the computer capture image on the vital microscope, you can literally watch the clot form. And so shown in the bottom panels here um, are the animals that, that had PAG level clamped up, if you will, like a, a glucose clamp, but we elevated PAG levels to uh, what's seen at high levels in humans um, versus normal saline vehicle control. And so the clot is forming faster. And then the time to vessel occlusion uh, or the bleeding time, if you will, but this is an in vivo thrombosis assay, is shorter. So a more prothrombotic phenotype is observed in the presence of PAG. Now, I so far have been kind of talking about how uh, the diet through phenylalanine leads to this formation and the clinical data really focuses on atherothrombotic events. Um, but one of the more interesting questions we had is how is it that if we infuse PAG and we see these phenotypes in animal models of cardiovascular disease, what is it that the PAG is doing? What receptor is it interacting with? And what I hope to convince you of is it's adrenergic receptors. Um, now, early on, our early studies suggested that there was a receptor that was present. And so what we looked at is could PAG bind specifically to cells? And so we could show that there was saturable and specific binding. That's a characteristic biochemical feature of a receptor ligand interaction. So it argued that there's a specific interaction occurring. We then also started using uh, pharmacologic tools such as um, various toxins like cholera toxin, uh, and others that suggested that a G protein coupled receptor might be involved in the reaction. But the GPCR gene cluster in Homo sapiens is the largest collection of genes that we have. So which uh, G protein coupled receptor it was, was, was not clear. Um, we then kind of noticed that the structure of PAG carries with it many similarities to uh, certain catecholamines such as uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and we hypothesized that perhaps that this might interact with uh, uh, adrenergic receptors and so actually then did a series of both genetic and pharmacologic studies that ended up proving that that's correct what is shown here is genetic uh, loss of function studies uh, where we used a megakaryocyte cell line mega one and using an sRNA or uh, approach to suppress the three adrenergic receptors that are found in platelets, that's alpha 2A, alpha 2B, and beta 2. And in each case, what we're able to show is that the signal that we could detect when PAG binds to this cell in the presence of PAG, you, that signal would disappear when we would uh, suppress the expression of any of the three adrenergic receptors that are found in that cell, whether it be alpha 2A, alpha 2B, or beta 2 adrenergic receptor. In an analogous way, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll say that we used genetic gain of function studies. So we took a cell type called HEC293, which has a very low background level of adrenergic receptors. It's used in the adrenergic signaling pathways. Uh, field because of this. It has a very, one of the few cells that has the lowest background of adrenergic receptors. And then when we transfected it with either the alpha 2A, the alpha 2B, or the beta 2 uh, gene, we would then endow the cell now with the capacity to be, uh, to recognize and signal with PAG. And uh, that is shown in this graphic. And then what's interesting is, so even with the genetic gain of function, we then have many pharmacologic tools with adrenergic receptors. We could show that then a specific antagonist for the type of 
uh, receptor that we had genetically introduced into the cell to gain the function, we could then reverse specifically with the antagonist, the inhibitor of alpha receptors or beta receptors. So in this way, we could very specifically show that PAG interacts with adrenergic receptors of multiple types. And overall, the scheme that was worked out uh, and reported in 2020 and involved over 5,000 patients worth of data was that not only does PAG track with heightened risk of heart attack, stroke, and thrombotic events, but it does so, we believe, by um, being first generated by gut microbes. Um, we identified the genes and gut microbes responsible for its formation. It interacts with hosts at adrenergic receptors, and this is true not only in the platelet, but in other cell types as well, and that this leads to enhanced uh, risk for atherothrombotic events such as heart attack, stroke, and actually now we're really focusing because of this adrenergic receptor link uh, in heart failure relevant phenotypes, uh, and that's something that we're, is our ongoing studies in the lab. So I talked to you about one of the unknowns, that was PAG. I'm going to now spend some time um, talking to you about the trimethylamine inoxide or TMAO, uh, that you've heard about. Um, studies that actually first discovered this began uh, over a decade ago uh, or came out in 2011. And you've already seen this slide or a portion uh, view of this slide. I wanted to just indicate that if one begins with a diet that's uh, observed in Western meals, such as, you know, high in animal products, and in particular, um, a red meat rich diet, which is high in both uh, not just cholesterol, but also carnitine and lecithin, phosphatidylcholine. Those two compounds are the major nutrient precursors that following digestion in the gut leads to the formation of TMA, which then in the liver is converted into TMAO. And then this impacts multiple processes in the body that has been seen. It, it alters sterile metabolism in, in tissues. Uh, it also impacts expression of endothelial cell activation cascades, uh, such as upregulation of adhesion proteins and, and inflammasome-related proteins. It also impacts expression level of, uh, uh, of receptors responsible for picking up modified lipoproteins. And TMAO, like PAG, impacts platelet function and reactivity. And if one has to actually you know, focus on what overall the TMAO does to patients. It's kind of illustrated in this slide, which is adapted from the end, like one of the figures that was in the paper that described uh, the connection between TMAO and thrombosis. And what has been shown is that the TMAO pathway is not only associated clinically with cardiovascular disease and clinically with stroke and heart attack, it actually chronic high levels of TMAO in patients and in animal models have been linked to adverse remodeling of tissues leading to fibrosis, such as heart failure development and chronic kidney disease development. And um, what I will show you are there are examples now where we can modulate this pathway with drugs and impact each of these endpoints. And so uh, the TMAO pathway is, is currently being uh, prosecuted, if you will, to try to develop drugs to bring to humans as a way of trying to lower these risk factors or these events. So what's the connection between TMAO and thrombotic events? Uh, I already mentioned that clinically a high TMAO is tracked or tracks with higher risk of thrombotic events. I should, oh, should mention Weifei Zhu, uh, a junior faculty in my group, uh, has been a, a leader in the studies uh, looking at TMAO and thrombosis potential. And I've already described this in vivo thrombosis uh, animal model where we do a surgical cut down and expose the internal carotid artery and are visualizing it with a fluorescent microscope. In the contralateral side, you inject a dye that is specific for platelet uh, fluorescent tagging. And so then when one gives uh, an injury to the internal carotid, and that's done with a chemical agent, 
Uh, one can watch the rate of clot formation over time. These are different still pictures from that cinema, the, the, the computer image capture that's tracking the clot formation. And one can see that with a high TMAO, the clot forms faster and the rate of occlusion is shorter or the, the time to vessel occlusion is shorter. So um, if one actually looks at plasma TMAO levels across the animals and the time to cessation of flow, one sees that there's a striking inverse correlation. The higher the TMAO, the shorter the time before the blood flow clots. So the in vivo thrombosis potential is higher. Now, this is in animals. Um, what about in humans? Um, how do we show, uh, well, actually, before we do the human data, I'm sorry, uh, how do we prove causation for this effect? Well, I mentioned Cox postulate and doing microbial transplant experiments. There are three different types that are kind of illustrated in this. One is to do a fecal microbial transplant from like a low versus a high TMAO producer. A second is to take monocolonized just take microbes, one that can or cannot make a certain microbe, for example, and transplant them into germ-free recipients and see if you can transmit the phenotype into the recipients. And then the third is to take a more complex, genetically defined microbial community that lacks the function you're interested in and then introduce an additional human commensal that has been genetically manipulated to have either a gain or a loss of function. And all three of these approaches were done and proved that uh, thrombosis potential is transmissible uh, in this particular publication. But I'll give you the example that was done with the human fecal transplant. So I'm going to show you data that came from a study where we placed healthy volunteers on choline supplements for up to two months, and we measured their plasma TMAO and platelet function. Um, but what we did is I'm um, illustrating here in green is this is a subject who, despite being on choline supplements, their TMEL level didn't go up. And the person in red is one of the people whose TMEL levels did go up quite high. And you'll notice there's a large variation and this variation between subjects is based on the microbial composition they have and whether or not when you feed increased amounts of choline to those subjects, whether or not the microbes are there to actually convert it into TMAO. Well, we took fecal polymicrobial communities from this low TMAO producer versus the high TMAO producer, and we transplanted those into germ-free recipients. And we were able to see, in fact, a dramatic shift in how much TMAO the germ-free mice could make. Germ-free animals can't make any, and then the high TMAO producers were making tenfold higher TMAO than the low TMAO producer. And then sure enough, when we actually performed this in vivo thrombosis study, we ended up seeing uh, a transference of a higher TMA, uh, not only a higher TMAO production, but greater rate of clot formation and heightened thrombosis potential uh, in the animal. So proving, if you will, um, the Cox postulate the same thing that Cox did with regard to tuberculosis or cholera in terms of transmitting the microbe from the donor to the recipient and transmitting the phenotype. You can use those same kind of uh, experiments to show that something as uh, interesting as like thrombosis potential is in part uh, related to uh, microbes that can be transmitted. Now, I had mentioned this is true for animals. What about for mice? What about humans? How do we actually show this is happening in humans? Well, we can't really do microbial transplant easily in humans, um, although <clears throat> I would say that with C. difficile infection, fecal microbial transplants are being used still. I, I think that in the future that will be a thing of the past eventually because complex microbial communities will probably be transmitted in the future rather than feces because there you don't know what else you're transmitting when you do uh, a large unknown fecal transplant but anyway how do we actually show that this pathway impacts clotting function in humans well we can place uh, individuals on choline supplements at a level that's equivalent to eating three and a half large eggs a day. This is done with Wilson Tang and colleagues here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, 
And we enrolled both vegetarian and vegans versus omnivores in this study and looked at what happened to their plasma TMEO level and their platelet function. And so shown here at baseline, if we took vegans and we placed them on uh, a choline supplement after one month, their TMEO level went up tenfold. And then uh, in response to a submaximal level of agonist, here it's ADP, their platelet agrogometry response went up. And then when one went from one month to two months, there was no further increase in either TMAO or the aggregation response. If we look at omnivores, and these are healthy volunteers, they had a low TMEO level to start with. They started taking the choline supplements. Their TMEO level went up 15-fold, and the aggregation response went up. What's also interesting, and in the interest of time, I'm not showing it to you, but that if one actually looks at what's the effect of TMAO on platelet function, what you end up seeing is that subjects whose TMAO is high, there, um, their platelet function becomes more pronounced. If you then place them on an aspirin, you can attenuate the heightened aggregation responses that were observed with the high TMAO. And so, um, uh, suggesting that uh, in the presence of a high TMAO, uh, perhaps being on an aspirin would be a beneficial thing. Now, what is remarkable is that if one looks across all of the TMEO levels that we did for all these subjects versus their aggregation responses, there is a striking positive association. The higher the TMEO, the more pronounced and more robust the aggregation responses uh, to a submaximal level of an agonist. So there is a relationship, at least with human platelets, uh, and that exposure just a brief period of time heightens platelet reactivity. Now, in the remaining few moments, I'm going to then just show you some uh, of the drugging approaches that we've done uh, to lower or to treat the gut microbial endocrine organ, if you will. Um, an obvious thing is, can you use diet to impact this pathway? And actually, this is what came up during the case study. Um, and, and actually, some early studies that have been done are illustrated here. If one compares omnivores versus vegetarians or vegans and looks at here, this is urine uh, levels of TMAO, uh, you see a lower level of TMAO produced uh, in vegetarian and vegans compared to omnivores. If one looks on the right-hand panel, and we're looking at the Mediterranean diet and a compliance tool that tracks with the adherence to the Mediterranean diet and characterizes it either as low, medium, or high compliance. And uh, one can see that dose dependently, the more uh, adherent to the diet, the lower the TMEO level. This is a study that was published just two years ago by our group in collaboration with Ron Krauss and Natalie Bergenauer. Um, what we did is actually a, a diet intervention study where all of the meals were provided to patients with through a metabolic kitchen and all of the subjects it was over 100 had a baseline omnivorous run-in diet for a two-week period and then they were randomized to three one-month intervals where uh, their protein predominantly came from either red meat white meat or a non-meat source the non-meat source was predominantly a vegetarian diet although it included egg white as well and each of these three diet periods were had a washout period in between. And um, what we were able to observe is the following, and that is while on the red meat diet, TMEO levels were higher uh, in subjects, and it really didn't matter on the order, red meat was always higher. Uh, diet, the TMEO level was higher when taking a red meat diet compared to either non-meat or white meat. Um, this is the first study that actually looked at how long it takes for a high TMEO to come down when you diet. And within a three to four weeks, TMEO levels came down. What's shown on the right is during the baseline run-in diet, if one characterized the subjects as either being a high or a low TMEO producer, meaning they're in the top 10% in red or the bottom 10% in blue, they tended to stay in as a high TMEO producer regardless of the diet uh, or a low TMEO producer regardless of the diet. Although there is a significant variation observed amongst subjects and 
what we were able to show is that this variation has to do with the microbial composition uh, in, their, in their gut and whether or not they harbor the type of microbe and the enzymes in those microbes that's necessary to convert carnitine into TMAO. Now, one of the questions that has commonly come up is, is there a paradox about this whole TMAO story? Is there something fishy about it? And that's because fish can have a high level of TMAO. And so I'm commonly asked or often asked, what about the fact that some fish have high TMAO? Well, um, first of all, one thing to keep in mind is that, yes, some fish have TMAO in them, but not all fish. In fact, the majority of fish do not. Um, what fish have TMAO in them for is they use it as a freeze avoidance mechanism. It's part of, um, you know, how do fish that are in polar regions or in very cold water prevent having ice form in their blood? They have certain small molecules that are raised to very high levels as a so-called antifreeze. Now, most fish do not have TMAO, but in the types that do, What's interesting is there's a very, very tight correlation between the depth at which the water in which the, the fish is harvested from and the level of TMAO that's recovered from the fish. And that's because the fish actually exquisitely manipulates the level of TMAO as an antifreeze to prevent freezing. Now, in a recent study, this is literally hot off the presses. The paper is less than a month old uh, out in public. Uh, we did a series of studies looking at TMAO and various interventions uh, with fish and seafood. One of the studies we did was simply to go to Westside Market repeatedly um, over the course of a year throughout and measure and get buy samples of different fish and seafood and then measure the TMAO content in them. And shown in red is the TMAO content in a variety of fish and seafood. And you can see there's a very large uh, range or a distribution. One of the major take home messages is that if one looks on the left hand side of the graph, um, freshwater fish do not have TMAO. So whether you're talking about walleye or catfish or trout, uh, et cetera, those do not have TMAO. On the other end of the spectrum is cod, lobster, orange ruffy. Actually, so fish that would end up in a fish McMillan sandwich or her fish sticks, those actually tend to be the type of fish that have a, a higher TMAO. Now shown in blue is the omega-3 fatty acid content that was simultaneously measured. And you'll see that, you know, we know that already that not all fish are created equal because many fish do not have omega-3s. And in fact, I would uh, just remind you that fish themselves do not even make omega-3 fatty acids. It's the algae in the water in which the fish are swimming that determines whether or not fish have omega-3. And it really depends on the water that where the fish are raised and what they're fed. If they're farm-raised fish, whether or not they'll even have omega-3. Now, what we did in a different, one of the intervention studies is we took four different fish or seafood that had varying levels of TMAO. And we fed this to healthy volunteers and measured plasma levels of TMAO on cereal days. So on the pre-day, this is the day before the diet intervention was the blood draw. On the diet day, it was like if they had for their dinner an eight ounce dinner of the indicated, whether it was shrimp or tuna or salmon or fish sticks, um, that blood draw was drawn the morning after the evening meal that was provided to them. And then the plus one day is one day following after the meal. And what you'll notice is that, first of all, some of them, like the tuna, the shrimp, there's really no change in TMAO that was statistically observed. With fish sticks, for example, the highest spike in TMAO was observed. Um, but this was highly variable. Some subjects had no increase or no statistical increase, and others had very striking increases. But in all cases, and these are healthy volunteers with normal renal function, by one day after the meal, the, the TMAO levels were back down to normal again. And so when performing TMAO blood testing, based on this kind of study, we have argued or suggested to advise patients to um, not eat fish or seafood the day before their blood test. But it also shows you there's quite a large, 
and substantial uh, dynamic range that's observed in subjects. And I'm just going to, in the interest of time, I'm sorry, we kind of, um, I'm going to go through these slides. I wanted to just point out that if one gives carnitine to subjects, if they're vegan versus omnivore, you can have a dramatic difference in the amount of TMAO that's produced. And this has to do with differences in the amount of the microbes that will convert carnitine into TMAO. Um, and if you actually feed a vegan chronically, either carnitine or choline over time, ultimately biochemically you shift them even if they continue on a vegan diet, we've shown that they will become biochemically looking more and more like an omnivore as the microbes in their intestine bloom that are the low, it started at very low abundance and you give them a, a metabolite that they prefer and are using to make TMAO. In a very uh, recent study uh, published within the last month, we actually, um, had the results of what's five years worth of work, and that was to tease out the overall biochemical pathway of how carnitine ultimately is converted into TMAO. It ended up not being a single step, but a multi-microbe process. And um, there's uh, multiple microbes that have the potential to convert carnitine into this intermediate called gamma butyrobetaine, uh, but then very few microbes that are more abundant in omnivores compared to vegetarian or vegans that do the second reaction, and that's convert gamma butyrobetaine into TMA, which is the immediate precursor for making TMAO. And I'll just leave that with that and end with, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna just go to one slide here, and that is uh, we have made drugs that block this pathway. Um, and um, here is an example uh, of a drug study where we ended up making uh, a second generation set of inhibitors that actually will block the conversion of choline into TMA. What happens is the microbe, the choline level in the cytosol of the microbe goes up. It, the, the microbe uh, senses this as an abundant carbon fuel source and upregulates the whole choline utilization gene cluster, including uh, the, uh, the choline transporter. So the microbe starts to become a vacuum sweeper, if you will, for sucking choline out of the intestines and the drug. You get very high levels of choline in the drug in the microbe. So the more the microbe is inhibited, the more it will prevent choline from being available to other microbes in the community. And ultimately, TMAO levels go down to exceedingly low levels. And so using that thrombosis model, for example, when we placed animals on a high choline diet, their TMAO level is quite high, 100 micromolar, but in the presence of two different members of this second generation of inhibitors of uh, blocking choline uh, TMA lyase activity, uh, you can block the diet-dependent increase in TMAO, and this reverses the diet-dependent enhancement and thrombosis, so the in vivo occlusion time uh, returns back to where it was at baseline. So I would just argue in our futures that um, beyond uh, the ability to intervene with diet, we will have drugs that will manipulate this pathway and it will play a role not only in manipulating atherosclerosis and thrombosis potential, but now studies have been reported using uh, drugs that target the TMAO generating pathway that impact and prevent heart failure development in animal models, chronic kidney development in animal models. And so it's uh, targeting this pathway, uh, we think will have benefits beyond extending beyond cardiovascular disease into other areas as, as well. And um, I'll just end uh, with that and leave time for if there is for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazen. That was an absolutely wonderfully done talk. Um, Dr. Kashyap, I think, echoes everything that we are thinking about fascinating work and very elegantly done studies. Although now, every time I put something in my mouth, I'm going to think of TMAO and the fish sticks in my freezer are going out of the house. Um, I'm going to have uh, people raise hands uh, so that we can ask comments or questions.
but in the meantime, if I can go to Dr. Morrow's question from the case about diet. So the question is, can if the patient really follows a very good diet, can the use of statins be avoided? I would argue that statins should not be avoided. Um, I, I think the cholesterol levels, the LDL levels are still too high in this subject. They're well above even the minimal national guideline goals of an LDL less than 100. So uh, I think it's remarkable that the person was able to bring about over a 20% reduction or a 25% reduction in LDL. Uh, typically, it's usually 10% is the most that you impact diet uh, dependent effects on LDL. But I, I still think that their risk is high. And um, if they're uh, so higher, I would say, you know, it's obviously Anyway, no, I don't think that they'll be able to diet it down any further. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bagheera, you have a question or a comment? I let Dr. Mehta go first. Dr. Mehta, you are first. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk, Dr. Hazen. Uh, I'm not, this is not a challenge, it's just a question. By reputation, the highest incidence of vegetarianism is in India, and yet by reputation, the highest incidence of coronary artery disease in India. Can you explain the paradox? Well, it's not really a paradox when you think about the concept that um, cardiovascular disease has is multifactorial and has many uh, underlying causes. It's not just cholesterol. It's not, in fact, East uh, Asian individuals often will have high triglycerides, which I mentioned Mendelian randomization and genetic etiology for causality for heart disease. Uh, triglyceride levels meet the MR criterion for being causally linked to cardiovascular disease and are higher in general in East Asian. Um, and so it's, yes, there's all, I think there's always going to be examples, you know, beyond cholesterol there, are, that doesn't negate the cholesterol as being a causal factor for cardiovascular disease, um, blood pressure, smoking, you know, there are many factors involved. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Baguera. Yes, I just want to thank um, Dr. Hayson for this great talk, but I want to especially thank him for accepting our invitation to be part of our endocrinology and metabolism institute. As uh, uh, you all know, um, Stan is an endocrinologist. He's very uh, bright and very humble and uh, we are really honored that he is part of our endocrinology institute he agreed to have our fellows rotating with him we're looking forward to uh, closer uh, scientific collaborations with him uh, and thanks to him uh, we have pretty much had double the number of publications that our institute has done over the last year so uh, thank you so much Stan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hazen. It feels like all of us, we cheated on the publication list here. Uh, but yes, I, I think all of us are very excited that our fellows also get to rotate with you. This is absolutely fascinating work. And uh, just, just seeing how you have progressed from looking at all these things in the gut and moving on to isolating and then connecting them to diet, that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, while people are thinking, I do have another question, Dr. Hazen. Do you, so I've had a couple of patients talk about fecal transplants. So are they ready for real time or where are we with that? Um, I think other than the extreme situation of uh, antibiotic resistant or recalcitrant uh, C. difficile infection where there is a, currently a role for uh, in appropriate setting with the appropriate like tertiary referral type of place. Um, I would not argue, I, I do not think that fecal transplants should be done, although there are clinics in some places that are actually proposing using this as a way of uh, treating uh, obesity and diabetes and other, it's, you know, we've seen patients who come through periodically our clinics that um, have had this. Um, the problem is, is when you do something like a fecal transplant, there, there's no way to normal, to standardize what's getting transplanted. And you're transplanting not just the thousands and thousands of different species and strains of bacteria, but then there's 
all of the phage and the, the viruses and the fungi, and there's no way to standardize and normalize this. Um, that's not to say that, again, they cannot have life-saving potential in C. difficile. We are seeing that, um, but I think that what's happening is the FDA is turning a blind eye to that and is waiting for something better to come so that they can then put a clamp down and say no more fecal transplants. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kellis, uh, I've got to let you unmute yourself to ask your very interesting question. <laughs> You muted yet. Wait. Do you guys hear me? Yes. Dr. Hazen, amazing talk. I actually trained with Dr. Marty Blazer, who I love, and I know that you guys have done a lot of collaboration, but my all my female nieces are turning vegan. And, you know, as a Greek, we like our Mediterranean diet, but once a week steak is always, you know, especially when we're not fasting for Lent, which is coming up, is something that we enjoy. So my question to you is based on all the research you've done, have you completely gone vegan or or <laughs> is it okay in your opinion to um, you know, have a PRN steak? First of all, doctors make the worst patients, so um, <laughs> so I don't always follow what I, I mean. My wife and my my daughters uh, themselves have now become much more. And my daughter's been vegetarian for like five years. Um, I think that you know I'm a big believer that, that diet is a person's choice, and it's not a religion. Mm -hmm. And you know, you we shouldn't beat people over the head with it. And um, and actually, truthfully, with TMAO, for example, this is an example of something you can follow the level and use it to help individualize or personalize dietary recommendations, just like you do triglycerides or cholesterol or glucose to some extent, because you can see whether or not what a person is doing is, is adequate enough. Or we have had patients who did not want to stop their not just once a week or once a month red meat, but they were eating red meat every single day and had very, very high TMAO levels. And then we use that to try to say, okay, why don't you introduce a vegetarian diet one day a week? And then a few months later we go, well, they didn't mind it. And then two days a week and over time have been able to help them to, to lower their TMAO level that way. Um, now, you could argue you don't need the test to do that. You can make these same arguments without that. But um, seeing a number sometimes makes a person, you know, easier to kind of chase after a goal. Um, no, I myself have not completely sworn off of all red meat, um, but I will say that it's been a very long time <laughs> since uh, I had a, a Fred Flintstone, you know, uh, Tomahawk steak. Tomahawk steak. <laughs> In fact, I can't remember. Thank it. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that uh, opinion. It's interesting you talk about numbers. Uh, when we do diagnostic CGMs, one of the things patients are surprised at is they see how the blood sugars go up with something they thought was healthy, but it clearly is not. So TMO might be kind of the CGM of the dietary world. 